All right, I think we are live, friends. Hello, Dave, Jose, Pastor Barry. Welcome to the conversation and welcome all of you who are listening in on uh, Facebook Live. We are, are aware that you're there. We don't see you, but we welcome you. And um, we, hope, we hope that this conversation is both enlivening and awakening. But for me, it's already been, as, as, the, uh, as the four of us have been talking, it's already been really deeply moving, enlivening, convicting. So welcome, and we hope and pray that it's the same for you. We are Parish Collective Live. Um, We started this actually through the pandemic, wondering if perhaps some of the conversations that we're all having, trying to wrap our heads and our bodies and our minds and our spirits around how it is that we faithfully be the church in our neighborhoods in this particular moment in time. Um, As these conversations were happening, we thought, well, why don't we have them a little more public and offer that out to our friends and our extended network. So that's what Parish Collective Live is. And today I'm excited about the conversation, uh, neighborhood economics and the role of the church. Okay, so, hmm, you know, you may not have placed those together in the past, but we're going to try to do that today. Neighborhood economics and what is the role of this of the church in place? So welcome, friends. Uh, I'm going to actually just begin, as we do every time, with an invitation to uh, place yourself, introduce yourself, tell us what neighborhood you're in, and um, and we'll just kind of start, go back and forth here. Pastor Barry, why don't you begin? Welcome, my new friend. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for the invitation, and I am honored to be here. So I am the pastor of Church of the Messiah, and it is in Detroit, Michigan. We're in an area that's called Island View. So um, we are a community-based church and we do everything to make Jesus Christ tangible in the world. So we have um, 213 units of affordable housing that the church has rehabbed. And then we have um, uh, a business incubation center inside of the church. We have a tea beverage company, clothing line, video production, uh, bow tie company, seasoning, spice company, smoothie company, all created by the people in the community and neighborhood. We're the internet provider for the neighborhood. So we're the competition for Comcast and at and um, Our congregation is mixed race. We are uh, 60% though, 60% of our congregation is African-American male under the age of 30. And we average somewhere around between two and 300 people. Um, Young people don't reject God, they just reject the package of church. So we just make God tangible and uh, we kind of take it to the street. So you have to come to church to pay your rent, come to church to get a job, come to church to get the internet, come to church to see a doctor, come to church to see an attorney. And eventually people turn around and say, let me see what church is like. I'm always in this building. And the work that we do in the street, evangelize and allow people to become part of the body of Christ. Whoa. Whoa, uh, I watched a one of the mini documentaries on your story. And Pastor Barry, one of the things that stood out to me is um, you are clearly an entrepreneurially uh, wired um, human and leader, but boy, your pastoral heart and the way that you mentor and care for your neighbors, particularly for these young guys, it, it, I was moved to tears. So um, what an honor it is. And also I heard you are you were voted Michiganian of the year. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, So Michigan End of the Year has been around for over 40 years. And I remember being 20, 30 years ago, I remember watching every year the Michigan End of the Year came out. I would stop and say, well, wonder how did you get that? And never thought anything about it, never known I would get it. And um, it just come from doing the work. And I was shocked when the Detroit News called me and say, you've been selected Michigan End of the Year. Um, that kind of surprised me. And it just let you know that when you're out doing the work, that people notice you're doing the work. You don't do it for fame or glory. You just do it because it's the right thing to do. But believe me, uh, people pay attention when you're doing it. So that was surprising. Mm. Mm. Amen. And yeah, I, 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 I hear that in your faithful, you were just faithful to the work and um, the significance of the neighborhood, but not only the, the neighborhood, but the city, and not only the city, but the, um, you know, the, the entire, like the government, like if people in power are looking and saying, who are the influencers? Yes. Clearly you, your presence, and the presence of the church in your place is actually uh, change-making for, for society, for culture. What, what an incredible uh, 
um, example and what an incredible possibility that is for us as we continue to learn what it means to be the church in our everyday lives. So thank you for your faithfulness. So glad you're here, Pastor Barry. Um, really, I am honored to meet you in person. Actually, would you also share with us what um, what is behind you there? I know we had a little conversation about that before uh, we began here. Would you share with us about those um, those people represented? Yeah, so I'm actually in our memorial chapel, and this is where we honor the innocent victims of gun violence. So Every face you see behind me is, is somebody who's been a, a, a victim of gun violence. Um, and we do have some people in the room who have just been longtime members, but uh, most are innocent victims of gun violence. So a part of the work that we do is to eradicate gun violence. And how do you eradicate gun violence? Um, one of the root causes of that is poverty. So we work to eradicate poverty so that people can have choices in life to where they don't have to think about um, gun violence has been a conflict resolution or have a dangerous city, this, that, and the other. But every time we lose somebody in Detroit, for the most part, we, we usually take their picture, hang it in here, and let everybody know and remember, this is a human being. And this is, they no longer have a voice. So we now have to be their voice. And we have to fulfill all of the unfulfilled talent that was on the inside of them. That is the motivation of the church. Wow. Thank you. I mean, that's incredible. That's real. You know, that brings this conversation into perspective to say this matters on the streets. This matters for the most vulnerable. This matters for the heroes among us that maybe our their stories are untold. And thank you for um, thank you for even choosing to sit where you are for this conversation, Pastor Barry. It 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 matters. It's meaningful to us. Um, so thank you. So actually, Pastor Jose, I'm going to pass it on to you. And I know that's a transition from what we just heard from Pastor Barry, but I'm so grateful you are here, my friend. And I know your context also holds uh, much complexity, much um, beauty, and much brokenness that, um, that this conversation matters specifically for. So welcome, Pastor Jose. Hey, thanks for having me. And I'm so privileged to be here with you all. And yeah, just listening to Pastor Barry, I, I, I wanted to relocate and <laughs> uh, become a part of his church because uh, it just sounded like just some powerful incarnational right now kind of uh, ministry. Uh, I'm located here in East Harlem, which is the northern part of uh, New York City. And I've been there for, I've been here for about uh, 20 years. I'm a native New Yorker as well. Uh, we started the church about, uh, I would say about 15 years ago, and uh, a lot of beautiful work. Uh, you know, it's a multiracial congregation that is now uh, embedded in a nonprofit organization that works uh, with people who are justice impacted and justice involved. So, that in our evolution as a church, uh, one of the things that we uh, came up with as a mission that we just felt compelled to was uh, how do we serve those who are serving the world? And that, that just basically came out of just what, looking at the profile of our uh, church in particular. You know, we have a lot of human service professionals, entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, creatives, and, and folks who just are do-gooders. You don't really have to sell them on, <laughs> on justice and, and having to get uh, roll up their sleeves and, and get involved in the community. Uh, but we're looking at questions of like, how do we rest together as a community? Uh, how do we support um, an organization where 85% of the uh, workplace profile, people who are working here uh, are people who are returning home from prison or from jail. Uh, real opportunities to just really connect with them. Uh, we're also part of an East Harlem collective of churches, uh, our own little mini um, parish collective here in our zip code. And what's really beautiful when we think about economics, just, uh, you know, we're small churches. We thought about how we could really like just pull together our resources. So for example, we're not this uh, one-stop shop of of ministry where we, you know, a lot of us can maybe afford a youth pastor, but we say, what if we pull our resources and we have our youth all going together into the same youth ministry across churches? And, you know, it's really uh, experimenting with some economic models that could allow uh, for all churches to really like just rise up together. Uh, we also um, collaborate together around uh, supporting small businesses. Uh, to something, um, you know, we didn't invent this, but it's called the cash mob. And so what does it look like to, you know, break the huddle after a Sunday service, after the benediction, and, and go and, and use our local dollars uh, to, to impact a local business owner, which is also, as a pastor, I think about this as also a, a, a discipleship thing, a formation thing. How are we formed to steward our dollars in, in our community in a way that uh, really uh, 
thinks about our neighborhood as an ecology, you know, and uh, so yeah, you know, the, uh, there's, there's a lot more I could say about that, but it, it's been just a, a real privilege uh, to really do ministry here in this context. It's uh, it's about 110,000 people in, in here dem demographically in, in East Harlem, in the neighborhood. Uh, it's also gentrifying, uh, like many communities across the country, and we're, we're consistently dealing with all the complexities of what that means uh, for our neighborhood, for people getting dis displaced, and uh, for what it also means to be the church right here, right now. Mm, thank you, Jose. Thank you. And I have your book right here. Uh, this is this is Jose's um, really fantastic book, and I will say it's called "Seeing Jesus in East Harlem." It's your it's essentially your story, but a really incredible practices and um, wisdom gleaned from this life of being the church in place. Um, and Jose and I do a lot of collaborative work on what it means to be the church in the neighborhood. The Parish Collective connects people to be the church in their neighborhoods all around the world, essentially. Uh, it, 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 in our neighborhoods and across neighborhoods. And I actually, and I didn't realize two things really quick, Jose, I have read this book. I am being completely honest. I read this book from cover to cut, from cover to back. It has that work, every, every word, every page. And I don't do that with every book. So um, it is a beautiful, it is a beautiful and, and compelling, to, uh, really just has been important in my own life. And um, and here's here's one of the gifts of the, concept of this uh, parish collective of, of these conversations is that I didn't realize, Jose, that that you are already um, exploring and experimenting with what, you know, collaborative youth work, which is what I'm trying to do, we're seeking to do here in my context here in San Diego. So now I'm like, oh, we got to follow up. I want to learn from what you're doing there. So um, these are the gifts of even these conversations is yes. we tell our stories and then we get to learn from them and continue to explore and experiment in the uniqueness of our own context, because my context Context, your context, Pastor Barry, in Detroit, um, in the East Harlem context for, for Jose, they're very unique, and yet we all are embodied humans incarnating neighborhoods, and that, that means we're a part of the human community. So thanks be to God for these growing friendships and connections. Um, Dave, I pass it on to you. Welcome, my brother. I also am um, in the midst of this incredible book by David Caresta, um, Jesus on Main Street. Why don't you tell us a little bit about this and um, and place yourself, my friend. Thank you. Um, so, so great to meet all of you. Jose, I have read your book uh, when it came out, um, really formative. So um, honored to be on this call with you. And Barry, we've, we've done a few of these things already now. Um, I actually look forward to meeting Barry in the flesh next week finally um this has been one of those zoom relationships um so i look forward to uh, actually meeting him at uh, ccba next week um, i'm in uh, phoenix arizona uh recently relocated there from portland oregon and um kind of my 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 place in all this is um you know i've spent 20 25 years in the high-tech industry um Kind of working um, with uh, startups, working with large companies, uh, helping raise money. And I got to a point where I felt God really like poking at me um, to pay attention to what was going on around me. Um, so if you're in high tech, a lot of times that seems to be kind of almost place agnostic. Um, so uh, God really um, drew me to to a, a course of study where I wanted to understand, you know, what are these things going on around us, such as gentrification, which Jose talk, just mentioned, such as economic development, such as poverty, you know, these are all these things that we've almost grown up as um, accepting as just like givens, um, things that just happen. I, I, didn't feel like that was right. And I also felt like um, we needed to have this conversation in the church. Um, so I actually looked at as part of my, uh, my doctoral research at this question of, you know, what impact do churches have on their neighborhoods? Um, particularly, you know, can churches accelerate gentrification? Can they actually move the needle on poverty? Those kind of questions. And it's amazing to be on this call with what I would call rock star pastors. Um, and I know, and I know you guys don't think of yourselves like that, but you guys are at the tip of the spear. Um, unfortunately, 
not, I don't want to be a downer here. Most of the church is not even close to where this conversation is at. So that's kind of where my heart is, is let's, let's, um, let's be um, a voice. Let's be gentle, but also let's be prophetic and let's be sharp where we have to be to encourage the church as a whole to really start considering their impact on their neighborhoods or their lack of impact on their neighborhoods. Um, so that was really kind of the heart behind Jesus on Main Street was looking at community economic development, which is a well-known discipline um, that's been around for, you know, decades, literally, but not necessarily within the context of the church. So I wanted to take some of those concepts and put it into the language of church leaders and put it into an accessible format for church leaders who could consider, um, okay, I love my neighborhood, but now how can I actually have an impact at a very tactical economic level? So I'm sure we'll have a chance to talk more about that. Yeah, we will. And um, your, I found that to be true, the accessibility. And I was telling you earlier, there's a passion to what you write. There's also a density. It's it's dense because this is costly work. I mean, this, it, this is not church as comfortable, you know, this is church as compelled. This is, our, this does require us to enter into disciple, a kind of discipleship that costs our very, uh, to, that examines our very life um, mm. and and the life of us as the body of Christ in a place. So thank you, um, Dave, for your commitment to this work. Uh, I, I actually wonder if we could begin, continue the conversation because everything you all have shared is a part of the topic, right? It's a part of what, why we're here in the conversation. But what is the starting point? Because I think you're right. There probably are a lot of um, people listening in, joining the conversation um, who are wondering, ah, like I can't, I am not where, you know, where Pastor Barry's church is at. You know, I am not where, I, I don't have the kind of network um, and connections and even insights or, or vision the way that you, that, that Jose does or, um, so what is a starting point? And I actually think let's, let's just like, let's get to the basics. And, and if we could even define neighborhood economics, neighborhood economics, I know that may seem kind of, uh, obvious to some of us, but to some of us, that's even a new concept, neighborhood economics. So just quickly, how would you all define neighborhood economics, um, which maybe is, is different from economics at large? So, so, so any of you can kind of start and we can even add to it as, as we hear each other. I, I'll, I'll jump in on that if you don't mind. Um, so yeah, I, I, um, think that a lot of people believe economics is kind of stuff that happens way up here like it's the Davos Switzerland crowd it's the you know the billionaires but also economics impacts our neighborhoods you know the, what are the jobs that are available um, are people able to get jobs are there you know retail outlets that are close by and convenient that can provide goods and services to a community um, so I think those are the things that we're talking about with neighborhood economics. It's like the reality of of our um, what's in our closets. How do we how do we get those things? How do we get food on the table? Um, but it is connected with larger economic forces, and that's where I think it starts to get interesting because then it could call for um, uh, some organized community organizing work, and you may have to push up against power as part of this. So I think that's that's also part of this challenge here is that there are forces in the world and there's injustice at play here. So to me, that's the starting point is recognizing the injustice of the current systems, economic injustice that creates um, you know, conditions where there is poverty, that creates conditions where people are being left behind by the current system. Um, so to me, that's kind of where I feel compelled to um, continually come back to God's heart for justice and his love for people. So good. And so helpful. Um, the connection between the local and also the systemic. Uh, what about either of you, Pastor Barry, Pastor Jose? Anything you would add to that? Yeah, I want to um, piggyback on what Dave was saying. One of the things that we noticed is we were dealing with um, economic 
problems um, in our community and in our neighborhood. And then we had a lot of people who would not necessarily qualify for some of the jobs because some of them were returning from prison. Some of them lacked the education. Some of them lacked the ability to be able to even do an interview or anything like that. So the church became the hub to be able to do that. And we took people who were in the church um, who were entrepreneurs and people who had the background, who actually had a business background, who were um, attorneys, who were uh, people who were accountants, people who had an expertise, and we use them. Can you, can you help us create a system, an ecosystem through which we can help our people get employed? The other thing, too, that actually worked with that, because we are the church, we get to work on your other issues, whether there's lights or water in the house, um, whether or not you have a driver's license or ID, whatever those things are. We get to work on those things, too. They are not comfortable. But if we really want to be able to prepare the people who are the least of these, we got to start at the bottom with those who uh, have all of those issues and the church can do that. We're mandated to do it. So that's one of the ways. Well, we are mandated to do that. Thank you, Pastor, Bar Pastor Barry. That's an important um, reminder and challenge. Yeah, uh, there's not much to add, but and I love that Pastor Barry had used the word ecosystem. Uh, so when we think about local economy, local economics, our neighborhood, it's, it's, the, yeah, it's the flow of goods and services and resources in an ecosystem. So when I think about economies, it's not, in, in, it's not just NASDAQ, it's not just Wall Street, it's not just uh, my personal budget, it's not just the stock market, um, you know, all of the things. It's not supply and demand, that stuff that kind of stays out there, but it's uh, how, how is it that resources are making their way uh, to Main Street, um, to you know, everyday folks uh, from business owners uh, to people who are running nonprofits, to uh, how uh, local elect elected officials are deciding on policy that also impacts people on the ground. Uh, so when we think about economy, uh, I think about yeah how it's 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 connected to ecology, and ultimately it's connected to faith uh, that this is our context, this is our place. And when we as a church think about the parish, right? Uh, we are thinking about uh, the well-being of a whole neighborhood. And part of that, right? When we think about uh, our faith and its expression in a place, economy has something to do with that. It has a lot to do with it. And unfortunately, we don't talk enough about it. Uh, so true, and I, and also Dave, I think you use the term. I I I wrote it down. Place agnostic. I'm. I want to actually let's let's keep talking about the church here. Let's move this second part of the comp right neighborhood economics and the role of the church. So um, when you said that, I got chills. When you said place agnostic, I thought, my gosh, perhaps. And, and I'm sort of jumping ahead here, but perhaps our new online churches, you know, and our and and there is a temptation to become increasingly online, right? Even in our hybridness, we can become increasingly online, perhaps become, you know, dislodged from place, if not place agnostic. And what is the there is a great um not only risk, but great devastating cost, the potential of that. Um, what, why does this matter for the church? You've all touched on it. You are living it. Um, Pastor Jose, thank you for bringing up how the church and also the, the, the charge, you know, from, uh, from Pastor Barry of we are mandated. So what does it mean for us, um, even theologically, to be mandated as the church to engage our places? And we're talking specifically uh, about uh, economically about the economics of a place so why don't what comes up for you all in that what why why does this matter so much for the church well let me just say that the church can make a, a bigger difference than it think it can um in our community and neighborhood we became a force to be reckoned with because we we do um housing the provider of the internet for those who can't afford it and our internet is free. And the people that we use um, to install it because they go to your house and install the internet. Uh, I must admit we do own most of the houses um, that 
when the knock comes to the door, it's the church, it's Church of the Messiah coming to install your internet. So, and the people that we took were the least of these, send them to school for 21 weeks to learn how to install the internet in their own community and neighborhood. And then the businesses that's created out of the church are people directly in their own business and neighborhood. So when you look up and you buy the tea beverage, like we have a tea beverage company called Nikki's Ginger Tea, and it's in all, of who, all the Whole Foods in the state of Michigan. It's in most of the gas stations in our community and neighborhood, and it's in most of the supermarkets in Detroit. So when you go and you see that, um, that tea beverage, that came out of the neighborhood, and it's in most of the stores in Detroit. When the person comes to install the internet, those are the people directly out of the community and neighborhood. And these are people who probably wouldn't have a job. It's also too, um, we have a clothing line that's also uh, distributed in the community and neighborhood. So you're looking at all of the people out of the church who are doing all of these great things. When you come to the church to see the doctor, the doctor is from the church, the attorney is from the church, the people who rent the apartment is from the church. So the church becomes this force to be reckoned with that now the government and other businesses have to pay attention to and have to come to the church. And then we do righteous economics. So we do it the right way. There is a living wage. It is bringing people out of poverty. So it's a different way of being able to do economics to whereas now um, the, the world's economic is now looking at the church's economics. So. Whew. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, you know, I, I would say, and David, you brought this up as well in the past of, um, you know, what you just described, Pastor Barry, I would guess is, is often not as, as easily on the radar of churches. We don't necessarily, we tend to not see the kind of role that you just described in your very tangible stories, your big stories and your little stories of how the role of the church, of how the very identity and call of the church uh, is and mission of the church is to be lived or is called to be lived out in a place. Um, Dave, you want to speak on that a little bit? Um, some of the contrasts of what we often think of when we think of the church and perhaps how this is a little bit of a different view. Yeah. Um, make sure I'm unmuted. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've really been... Um, challenged by this passage in Micah that I want to read. Micah 4.4. 4. I'm, I'm stepping out of bounds here. I'm not the pastor. It's, you know, I'm not a pastor here, but I'm going to be throwing some scripture around. Uh, but they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid. That's Micah 4.4. 4. Um, I, I shared that at a workshop that I did last week, and it's just it was impactful. It wasn't me. It was just God speaking because um, God cares about people, but he also cares about the places they're in. And I think that that, you know, what you heard Barry describe is a tangible example of that. And the work that Jose is doing, we cannot ignore what's going on in our place. Um, and a lot of those things that are going on have to do with economics, have to do with um, larger changes such as neighborhood change, such as gentrification, such as demographics that are changing from underneath us. Those um, things we can no longer ignore as a church because they are impacting people. You know, we see the wall on, um, that Barry has behind him. They're impacting people in very real ways, the things happening in our neighborhoods that are being largely caused by some of these large forces that many in the church have just kind of said, well, we're just going to preach the gospel. We're not going to worry about economics. I'd say that those two things are intimately tied. I, I love the John chapter one uh, paraphrase by uh, Eugene Peterson, right? Uh, in the message where he says, uh, the word of God became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. And what I love about that is that, yeah, it takes, you know, the logos, God, right? This, what, what, what could have been an abstract reality and um, brought into a place and a specific zip code. And I think uh, when I think about that pastorally and also um, just even, you know, how, how pe every, 
everyday folks can do theology. Uh, is like, how do you move through neighborhoods, not only in your body, right, in an embodied way, but um, how does your, your wallet move with you? <laughs> so it's, it's about how um, people can think about how finances uh, are an extension of the resources that God gives us to bless others. And uh, Pastor Barry was all over that. You know, um, I, we have a, a similar situation here um, at Exodus Transitional Community where they are uh, creating some for-profit enterprises uh, to give people jobs other, who, who otherwise wouldn't get jobs in other places uh, because of uh, backgrounds and, and, and such. And I think to bring it back to the church, to your point, uh, Christiana, uh, how do we get our people to think about such things, not as community service? I'm, I'm giving back, I'm doing something. Oh, that's great. You know, they're improving the neighborhood. No, actually, this is more than that. Uh, when we think about uh, just even the word economy itself, right? The Greek word, it's, it's oikonomia, weikonomia. It, it's the rule of the household. It means that, that, this, that, that God is sovereign over this, this block. Every mural, every sidewalk, every street sign, everything, right? And how are we caring for it? So, you know, we often think about creation care, right? In gardens and places like that, you know, forests. But how does, how does creation care happen in the hood? And how is it that we can uh, th get our people, Christians, the church, to think about uh, how to reinvest dollars, how to impact policy in a way that is connected to their faith. This is not just an afterthought. This is not a community program. This is an expression of my faith when I support small businesses, when I do these things. You know, as, and as you are all three speaking, I thought a, a very simple filtering question for ourselves, even just a pause in this moment, when you uh, imagine you, yourself as a part of the body of Christ in your neighborhood, as a part of the church, uh, who, as that body, that collective body, who are you known as? Who, how do your neighbors know you? What is your, what is, when we talk about the word role, it's actually a, a part to play. Um, and I think that's a really good examine, self-examine, communal examine question. Barry, you know, when I imagine your neighborhood, and also you as the Michiganian of the year and the church as, uh, you know, the internet provider, like just a simple, we're known as the internet providers. We make sure that there's accessible internet to all students who need to, who have great capacity and desire to learn. You know, little things like that. I'm not, I think these are really good questions, really healthy, really holy questions for us to ask as we are seeking to be faithful. I actually want to pivot us a little bit to that sense of examine. Um, Jose, I was rereading parts of your book this morning. Um, and here's a quote I want to read. Um, you said, um, in her engagement with the world, the church is challenged to continue to be a public cons of public consequence of public consequence. There's a consequence of our presence as the church in wherever we are inhabiting. This is a call not so much to remain relevant in the sense of being popular, but rather to be rooted and discerning the pulse of the times, responding to what is required of her, required of the church, required of her in the moment. It's a contemplative way of inhabiting our zip codes. So I think as we even shift toward um, the question of how do you even know what to do? What, what are simple steps? How do you know how to shift? How to, how to, for some of us, we are, you know, aware and attentive and engaged. For others of us, other body of Christs in neighborhoods, this is a shift we have to make. So I really appreciate this um, question mark of contemplative awareness or contempt. What is the contemplative way? What is the examined, the way of discerning the spirit of God in a place? So maybe think and ponder on that for a moment. Um, could you could you each share with us either personally or something you've seen? What are important postures, contemplative postures to take um, in any given neighborhood or context? And maybe even Barry, that comes to you first of how did you even know what to do? 
how did you even know where to start or you know where did the clothing company idea come from how did you know how was the, how did the spirit of god lead you my brother well let me just say that for the most part church of the messiah does not do social services we really do empowerment services and when we say empowerment we we spell it i P-O-W-E-R-M-E-N-T, the power from within, the power of your God-given ability to build and create, and then you come from the ultimate creator. So you have to come to the table with something. So instead of coming with your hand out, sometimes you put your hands up and you ask God, what did you pour into me? So we always tell people, what's on the inside of you? If you can bring the gift and talent that God gave you to life, and you had the resource and the conduit through which to do it, which is that church. Let us see if we can build that with you. So the ideas come from the people, it don't come from the church. The people say, I have this gift to make clothing. I have this ability to cook. I got this tea recipe. I have this ability to be able to draw or to write. And we take that to the next level, to the best ability. Um, I got to throw a scripture in there, too, because I love what uh, Dave and Jose said. And the scripture that we use at Messiah is 1 Corinthians 4 and 20. The kingdom of heaven is not mere words. It's a demonstration of power. How do we demonstrate the power of God in a world that is so wrong? How do we take that and how do we bring that to fruition? And let me just say, too, when, you, when you're doing economics and you help to bring people out of poverty, and I also mean a poverty mindset, and that is done with the scripture and it comes through church, that is the best evangelism that you could do because you're not going to anybody and saying, you know, God loved you. Let me tell you about this wonderful God. When you're helping somebody start their own business, get a job, get into uh, school or these types of things, they stop and they ask you, so tell me about the motivation behind this. Tell me more about your church. Where is this coming from? Well, not that you ask. Now we can go into that, but it comes from providing the source of what's needed. Jesus healed the people and they followed him. So it's all of these things. We're healing the demons of today. These are the modern day demons that the church is tackling today. So then therefore now we have an opportunity to testify as to who he is. And it's easier to witness to somebody who actually have their needs met than somebody who's looking for their needs met and we're giving them the gospel, but we don't give them the tangible resources to do it. So our thing is we put it out to the community. What do you bring to the table? They brought all of the tea beverage business, the clothing line, the video production, housing, and um, the internet, the doctors. Office. These were the ideas of the people in the community and neighborhood and members of the church who said this is what we should do. And that's why we do it. Amen. I wish you could. I wish we were unmuted and we could just, yeah, we could clap and amen to that beautifully. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How about the others of you? Anything come to mind? Yeah. Go ahead, Jose. Oh, you were unmuted. I was just going to say you, you, you go ahead. Uh... All right. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, there's a tendency, especially for my white brothers and sisters um, from maybe more affluent churches that they would take a posture of um, kind of, we're going to go in and save this community. We're going to go and bring our resources and, and we're going to, you know, take the, the neighborhood for Christ. I'd say that's the, the polar opposite of the, of the posture that we should have and the polar opposite of the posture that Barry just described. Um, so in terms of like a starting point or a posture, I'd say it's one of being a listener and being um, a servant um, I, I would say, you know, one of the critical things that a church can do is to look around their community and discern, you know, what are the resources we have in the community? What does that ecosystem already look like? Um, in, in Pastor Barry's context, it sounds like there was a lot of things that um, were, uh, um, were needs that needed to be fulfilled. So they, they provide internet, they do all these things. That's not the case in all neighborhoods. Some neighborhoods may already have somebody, you know, a nonprofit providing some workforce development. There may be another, um, you know, individual who's an entrepreneur who's just looking for a way to mentor younger entrepreneurs. I think the church can play a vital role in identifying that ecosystem and pulling it together and giving it some cohesive energy and vision. 
Um, so in some cases, you know, the church may be really um, an important part of that equation. In other cases, the church may be a little bit more behind the scenes, you know, pulling people together, um, encouraging connections, and um, identifying gaps and resources that need to be filled. So I'd say there's that real kind of posture of learning, listening, discerning to figure out, you know, what does it mean in my context to, to move from a place of injustice to justice? So sometimes that means, yeah, the church really takes, takes a big major role, or in some cases, it's more of a, you know, nurturing this ecosystem. Oh man, that, 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 this is actually a great segue. You made it so easy for me. It was kind of a lob in, in as we say in basketball and alley -oop. Uh, I, I think uh, it's an important contrast. There, there are certain churches that are, are gonna be more one-stop shops and they'll, they'll provide a multiplicity of services, which is a beautiful thing. It could be a form of a hub. And in our case here in East Harlem, we're in New York City, we have no shortage of nonprofits. We have no shortage of services. We have no shortage, uh, and we have shortages of land, of course, and property and all those things. So uh, to use Dave's language um, and also our, our, our faith language, it, it is a process of discernment. And this, this question that we often ask as a church, as those who serve the world, is, is very connected to what uh, Pastor Barry talked about when he said, look, look, look at the entrepreneurs, look at what the people are doing, look at their skills. We asked a, a, a very similar question. And how can we get on God's agenda for your life in the world? That's what we're asking parishioners. And that's where we're also asking people in the neighborhood, small business. How can we get on God's agenda for your life in the world, for your dream? You're not just a business owner. You're someone who has dreams and visions for uh, seeking the shalom of this neighborhood. And how can we walk alongside of you um, in that. And in many ways, we become that, uh, that presence, that nurturing presence of, for example, with our church specifically, uh, we raise a holiday offering and a portion of that goes uh, toward, and it's not micro lending, actually it's a small grant toward entrepreneurs within the church community itself. Uh, so there are folks that are involved in the arts and theater. Some folks wanna start a house church. We're, we're, we're dedicating a portion of that uh, for them to do work in the world, work in the neighborhood. And I think that these are an extension, once again, we, uh, of, of the Great Commission. You know, uh, you know, when we talk about making disciples, I would think that it also is about uh, empowerment, as, as Pastor Barry talked about. How do we get our people to think even economically in a way that they recognize that their contribution, their business, their dollars, their talents, their gifts can have a direct impact on the ecosystem outside of the church. And, and that's, that, that leads us to a decentering and that leads us to, to different questions as a church as well. Uh, great. Yes. What are the new, what are the different questions? You know, what are the questions that we need to re examine? We need to rethink. We need to, we need to get, get back to the whiteboard. Um, and not only for church leadership, but for the whole community. This really is a, isn't, I think what I'm hearing from you all, and especially saying this came from the people, you know, this came from the community. And also, uh, this came from the neighborhood. So I wonder too, even thinking wider than just who's in our church, but who is in our neighborhood and what are the dreams and desires and what is God, the agenda of God, you know, p deposited inside of our neighbors that we can actually uh, come alongside. Another thing came to mind for me, it's actually very fresh because last night uh, we hosted a progressive dinner on our street and um, I brought, you know, invited a bunch of neighbors and outdoor, you know, trying to still kind of, uh, you know, cl our clumsy way of trying to stay uh, COVID safe. And um, we asked to just began with the question of, you know, we love Golden Hill. This is the one thing we have in common. We have other things, you know, between different ones of us. But one of the things we have in common that none of us can deny is that we have a neighborhood. We share a neighborhood. And so I said, do you love this place? Do you love Golden Hill? You know, you first have to start, do you love it? 
And if you love it, what are some things you love about it? But what are some things that you hope for, um, things that could change? And what I found was the disparity of answers was, were so fascinating because our neighbors are all so different. So one, when we started talking about businesses in the neighborhood, people named, mostly started naming all the flashy businesses, right? And then I'm thinking, wait, why has nobody named, you know, some of the little startups or the little seemingly insignificant? What about the flower shop on the corner? That they've been there longer than you, much longer than you've been there, so providing beauty. It's a business. Well, you know, let's honor it. And what are ways we can support it? And so um, I found that even just a simple thing like bringing neighborhoods together to uh, to to honor and to be aware of, and also maybe to open up some of our blind spots, depending on who you are. You know, the people in in particular ways of privilege in our neighborhood can be very disconnected and unaware, and that's that becomes contributing to particular injustices in the neighborhood. But sometimes a starting point is just kind of trying to open, see if we can learn from each other and open up our blind spots and take little steps because big changes can happen when neighbors come together and imagine and dream together. And here I am, you know, I know this is actually the dream of God for this place. And I'm unashamedly, actually we ended the night with our um, Muslim neighbor asking if we could sing Amazing Grace together. And so we're all circled around singing Amazing Grace across our very different, you know, very disparate differences. And it was a sacred, holy moment. Um, so I wondered if we could just even in a sense of saying, hey, for me, one thing that I've learned is uh, I want to bring neighbors together and become at least a little more aware, not only for myself, but for other neighbors, because we need each other. This can't just be a silo church uh Ch church activity, you know, we are we are interdependent with other entities um, in the neighborhood to actually for the flourishing of the whole place. So what are um, when we think about a toolkit, Dave, what are some really simple next steps? And if you were going to if someone was um, asking us here as we end, we only have a few more minutes. But, you know, what's what's one thing you hope I take away from this conversation? One small act I could do. Um, what would you each say? And we'll have each of you answer and then we'll say goodbye. Did you want me to go first? Was that? Sure, Dave, take, go ahead. Oh, um, well, so, well, either Jose or Barry already mentioned it, but I'm going to steal their idea. I love this idea of buying local. Maybe it was the cash cash mob that Jose mentioned. I mean, what a what a powerful mechanism to um, bolster a local economy and to raise awareness. So yeah, maybe instead of going to, you know the large, um, you know, home improvement store that's got the orange banner in front of it. I, I don't know if I want to use the name here. Maybe you go to the local Ace Hardware store. Um, and it's sometimes, I know that. And I'm, I'm every bit to blame as this, you know, as anyone else in this. I love to order from Amazon. I mean, you can get stuff tomorrow. And I'm constantly being um, challenged, okay, can I go buy something local instead? Um, so I'd say that's a good, great place to start. And that'll start opening your eyes, like you just said, Christiana, to these local businesses, the local flower shop. Instead of calling one flowers, just go walk down there and, and buy your bouquet for your, for your loved one there. Uh, I, I would say, uh some low-hanging fruit would be just to curate a, a shalom walk. And we've done that here as a church and we've done it with neighbors as well. Uh, basically what's in your hood. <laughs> uh, sometimes we do overlook the, the local mom and pop shop, the hardware store, the barber shop, and, and, and that place or, you know, Elemendorf, which is the oldest church, or reform, the first reformed church, oldest church in, in East Harlem. And, and so you'll be surprised what a discerning walk uh, attached to uh, scriptures uh, will do for people's sense of awe and wonder for a neighborhood and what God is doing or uh, and what God has been doing even before we got there I think you know just to come at it more humbly as well so uh, I think that uh, walking tours are just a real simple formative thing to do and then um, I've had people even stop on street corners and, and break out in like spontaneous prayer you know, over the elected officials office, right? Our local council member, uh, this public garden there that represents, you know, one of the few public spaces 
left in a city that's always pri privatizing everything. Like where, where are the public spaces? Where are the places where we can be together, rest our feet and, and, and be a community? Uh, so I, I would say that the first place is, is seeing how, uh, because how we see something, somebody, some place is just as important as how we serve. So oftentimes we wanna jump into serving but how we see somebody, how we see that person, that per person just getting out of out of prison, out of jail, um, you know, the, the folks in the, in the housing projects and public housing, how we see them is just as important as how we serve them. So, and I would say um, you don't need all the answers. Come with your piece. Before Jesus fed five thousand, two fish, five loaves. Bring a little bit that you have. And understand that you're working within a community. I always stop and think about that. Here's Jesus Christ, the son of God. And what did he do when he started his ministry? He assembled a team. You don't have to be the brightest. You don't have to be the best. You don't need to know the whole plan. You have to be willing to go. You have to be willing to, to follow, to be part of a community. You don't need all the answers. But also understand, too, you don't need faith when you're dead. You don't need courage when you're dead. You need these things while you are alive. Don't wait till the end of your journey. Get brave. Start now and think about the different things that you can start with right now. You don't need everything. Start today with what you have and you will be surprised who show up and how God shows up and then what the bigger plan will be. But start now. Amen. Amen. Get brave. Well, I feel like I want to get brave even more. Uh, truly, truly, I, I feel grounded and I also feel excited and compelled, but I want to get brave. And I, and I pray for all of us, but for the church at large, may we get brave in the Jesus way and inhabit our neighborhoods faithfully for the sake of economic equity, for justice, for freedom for all. Amen, brothers? Amen. Thumbs amen. up, thumbs up. <laughs> A Zoom amen. Well, um, thank you. Thank you so much for being a part of this to uh, all of you who've been listening on Facebook Live. Uh, this conversation lives on. So it'll be up here if you didn't catch all of it or if you want to share it, please do. Um, this just scratches the surface. Of course, there are many resources, but also feel free. We would love to continue the conversation with you if, if more questions come up um, and look for us next week. We're going to actually or on the 10th, we're actually going to have another conversation um, with uh, Dr. Esther Meek. So that should be a wonderful conversation as well. You are all welcome and bless you. Uh, may we get brave as we inhabit faithfully our neighborhoods in the power and name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.